your four-year-old self. Your four-year-old self has probably learned by the age of four, maybe five, that um, wanting a thing does not immediately create its reality, right? I want it, but some reason mom doesn't give it to me. And all of us can remember that frustration, and perhaps you can also remember the time that it occurred to you that maybe if you planned correctly, you could still get it. And so you have been thinking that if you can just get mom to say yes first, before the request is made, if you can trick her, then she'll have to say yes. You'll have to get to watch that TV show, or you'll have to um, get the puppy that you're, you're going to try and figure out how to negotiate for. If you can just convince her to say yes, before she knows what the request is, you're in. You're golden. And so you kind of walk into the room with your little best smile on because you know you're cute. And, and you can maybe give her a little hug and you say, Mom, say yes. You know, and here's the thing. Mom has, has been around the block. Mom knows a thing or two. Mom has been a four-year-old. And so mom manages to keep her face neutral, right? There could be a really frustrated scowl that she knows she's being manipulated. But no, keeps it neutral. There could be the <laughs> sort of laughing of, oh, dear, you're so transparent. But no. And she just says, Oh, oh, what are you, you going to ask? <laughs> Three times in a row, Jesus has told his disciples that he is walking literally towards Jerusalem. They are on the road. They are headed to Jerusalem. And three times Jesus has said, here's how this is going to end. Suffering, a cross, death. And resurrection. And every time in a row in the Gospel of Mark, it happens once. And Peter says something very wrong. He says, Oh no, Jesus, let me tell you how to be the Messiah. Oh. Jesus kind of gets that settled. A little more goes on. And then again, Jesus says it. And the disciples follow behind him, arguing about who's the greatest. And again, Jesus has to correct them and takes a little child and says, No, guys, this is what God's kingdom looks like vulnerability and openness and then now here we're at the third one Jesus has just done it again he has described the path that he is on and they are literally walking alongside him towards Jerusalem and again they get it wrong right James and John are almost comical teacher we want you to do for us whatever we ask I don't know. We have a few teachers. How well does that go? No. And even as, as, uh, as he keeps writing, Mark, you know, Jesus is explaining to the whole crowd of disciples, and he says, well, you know how Rome works. They lord it over people. Oh, but you don't work that way. Right? I mean, Jesus is even a little sarcastic here. It's, oh, it's not like that with you. The disciples are really kind of an exaggerated version that catches our eyes. We laugh. But also, they're this perfect mirror to who we are, right? Honest, natural reactions to Jesus. Because he is talking crazy. He's talking about deliberately walking into suffering and death, despite the fact that they know he is magic, right? They have seen what happens when Jesus is around. Healing comes out of nowhere. Enough for everyone appears ready. They know this about him, and they know that he is the Messiah. That's the one thing they've gotten right. They know that he is the one that God has promised, that they are waiting for. And so when he says these things, it just doesn't make much sense to them. And in their sort of exaggerated version of responding, they show ourselves the truth. They show us the truth about ourselves, which is when we are worried, when we feel under attack, anxious, afraid, we are always tempted to take care of ourselves, right? We always move into self-preservation. We give into our fears about scarcity. And we see our companions, the people we've been traveling with, suddenly as rivals. We get territorial. We get suspicious. We um, move to extremes. So the opinion that we have held is now firmer 
more exalted and louder in either direction, right? We start looking out for number one. We're not interested in sharing anymore. And we even start to throw each other under the bus preemptively. The bus hasn't even gotten here yet, but if I throw you under now, when it arrives, I'm in a better position. We do that. And so the disciples walk through scripture, kind of bumbling a little bit so that we can see ourselves. James and John hear Jesus talking about things going south. And it turns out they weren't just standing in the back whispering about this plan. They heard it. And it made them worry. And despite that, they're sure that Jesus, this is going to work out with him. He really is the one. But getting to the end sounds a little scarier than they thought. And they notice that Peter messed up. Right? He was always the go-to guy. Well, he messed up. He stuck his foot in his mouth really bad. It's still there. We have an opportunity. Number one and number two disciple, maybe those positions are open. We're going to negotiate for them. And we're going to do it before the other guys think of it. There might not be enough glory to go around. You better get your piece of it now. Because you know how Jesus is. He likes to make sure everybody's taken care of. That might not be enough. He'll spread it too thin. Get in now. And I can't help but imagine Jesus still as that mother, right? But now it's my five-year-old self who has rolled in mud and um, is in over my head. And I can just imagine that mother saying, oh, buddy, oh, buddy. I can see Jesus looking at his disciples, these dear, hopeful people who are so wrong, just saying, oh, friends, this little one has rolled in the mud, coated herself from head to toe, coated the house on the way in. Feels like that's probably enough, but the little one doesn't understand that the teddy bear that she took with her is not going to be clean for nap time. And that when you're cream, cream, screaming and crying and you're muddy and you rub your eyes, you've created another problem too. And you can just see mom going, oh, buddy, you didn't know how deep you were in. And I can just see Jesus saying, oh, friends, oh, friends, do you have any idea how deep you are in? Dear James and John, you want Rome to be done with. You are tired of God's people being under somebody's boot because they have been again and again and again, and you're tired of it, and you've been waiting for God to do something. Yes. You're ready for the pecking order that this world establishes to be turned on its head. You are following Jesus because this society that is built on a couple people having all the stuff and everybody else suffering, that's no good. You're tired of the violence that underlies every piece of that society, Jesus thinks. But now you're coming to me, trying to edge out your friends. You're trying to put yourself on the top of the new system. You're coming with this vision of a victory banquet for the new king and the honored seats on the king's right and the king's left. Oh, friends, you have no idea how deep you are. I had to dig up the source of a, a quote that always sort of floats around the back of my mind. Um, and it turns out it's from Nietzsche, who I do not read for, for leisure. But he said, anyone who fights with monsters should make sure that he does not, in the process, become a monster himself. And that just tells the truth about a lot of things, doesn't it? Poor James and John are people like I am and you are, who are situated in systems of sin and violence and power that are not going to let us just walk away, right? James and John have left everything to follow Jesus. You'd think they might be free from the things that own them, but there it is in their own heart all the while. And that's how we are, right? Sin infects our thinking. Sin tells us that the only way to overcome evil, which is indeed evil, is to use its tools. Sin tells us that when we're threatened and when we're vulnerable, there will not be enough for everyone. That the only way to stop being on the bottom of that pecking order is to elbow your way to the top and make sure you're holding someone else down. Leadership and glory and power, oh, they're at the top, aren't they? 
and you got to do what it takes to get there. Then you can make some changes, right, that need to be made. But you got to get there first, and you got to do it at whatever the cost. Oh, friends, Jesus says, you're looking at the wrong leaders. You have spent so much energy hating Rome, but it's got you playing its game. You're acting just like Rome, right? There's somewhere else to look, though, Jesus says. There is somewhere else to look. Stop looking at the shiniest and the highest and the flashiest and start looking at the ones your gaze usually slides over, right? The ones whose names you've never actually asked, so you, you don't know them. The ones who you certainly don't make eye contact with. The ones who are shut out of the power games. They're not playing because there was never a chance. What does a leader look like in God's kingdom? What does a leader look like in the new way that Jesus is bringing? What does glory entail? What is that position near enough to God's heart, close enough to Jesus that you can finally feel secure? It's a servant. It's somebody whose purpose is not their own power, place, and glory. If you want to be great, Jesus says, then your work and your purpose has got to be other people. That is how God's kingdom works. And that word Jesus uses there is diakonos, this servant word. It's not used randomly in Mark. Mark only uses it to describe women. Peter's mother who is healed and then immediately serves the disciples. Women who have followed Jesus throughout his ministry at the end of the gospel there are described as serving Jesus. And no, they don't even get names. Mark, sometimes he paints those male disciples as getting it spectacularly wrong. And then he points to these women who are never described as being in their place in Mark. Their place was with a spouse, but they're never attached to anybody. They're just sort of free-floating, contributing what they need to, what is needed for the welfare of others. And that's where Jesus points. Follow those leaders. It's nonsense to the disciples. It's mostly nonsense to us because we're all infected with the world's way of thinking. But this is what we need if we want to have that security, to have that confidence that we are held in God's kingdom. That's where God's kingdom lives. With the leaders who are tending the door and the leaders who are clearing the plates and the leaders who are wiping the bloody knees. You know, the disciples, they get it wrong again and again. And you might think Jesus would just give up. But the great good news of this story is the good news of Jesus' story altogether, which is that he sends nobody packing. He just keeps walking to the cross. That is the only way that James or John or you or me is ever going to see any of this is if Jesus keeps going to the cross. Only because Jesus is going to, to live that service in the most complete way possible can we begin to understand to live and to die and to rise for others to set aside all the power and glory that he actually is entitled to that we are not only because he's willing to walk all the way through suffering and death he knows that the consequence for not working the way the world wants him to is going to be bad here is someone powerful here is someone free. Here is someone who does not play the game of pecking orders and who turns it on, on end at every opportunity. That is not going to end well. Jesus has been describing this from the beginning. The world is not going to be pleased with this. And yet, he doesn't run. He just keeps walking toward Jerusalem. And he goes because that's how he frees James and John and how he frees us. You have to wonder, too, as, as they make it to Jerusalem and James and John understand that on his left and on his right are positions that exist, but they're crosses, that uh, they start to understand that glory does not look like they thought it did. On Jesus goes to the cross because that is how he frees you, and that is how he frees me. Jesus goes first. Jesus goes first. There is another way, and Jesus opens it by going first. 
He goes first into living for others so that he can break the power of all those systems that want to hold on to us and all the small selfishnesses that want to drive us. Sets that all on end because it wants to own God. It wants to own God's creation. And Jesus walks through it and says, go ahead and try. And then rises to say there is nothing in this world that can hold God's kingdom. It looks so tiny to you. It looks so ridiculous to you. And yet it lasts when everything else fails. There is another way, Jesus says. He has opened it for us. Thanks be to God.